In a letter to CNN, Mr. Page wrote, quote, I would eagerly welcome the chance to speak with the committee to help finally set the record straight following the false evidence, illegal activities, as well as other lies distributed by certain politically motivated suspects in coordination with the Obama administration, which defamed me and other Americans. When I spoke to Mr. Page recently, he told me that his contact with Mr. Trump basically amounted to going to some Trump rallies. Did you ever brief Donald Trump as a candidate or uh, a, as a president-elect? Uh, president Trump said it absolutely 110 percent accurate. I never briefed him. And in reality... Did you ever meet him? I never shook his hand. I've, I've been in, you know, many rallies with him from Arizona to North Dakota to many in New York. Rallies. And I, rallies. You know, which is, which is meetings, you know. So, so the hundreds of thousands of people who have been not to rallies? Hundreds, I mean, not, not, you know, I've been in smaller no, no, rallies. No, no, I'm saying the, the that, hundreds yeah. or tens of thousands of people who have been yeah. to Donald Trump rallies, can they say they've been in meetings with Donald Trump? I've been in smaller ones as well. But, What's you know. the smallest? I mean, have you actually been in a meeting where foreign policy was discussed? Anderson, listen, they were dis often discussed in, in rallies, et cetera, as well. Right, right I so, know, but, you know, if I go to a, a rally of Donald Trump's, it doesn't mean I'm an advisor to Donald Trump. It doesn't mean I'm going to a meeting with Donald Trump. I happen to be at a, I'm at a rally. So you went, to, you went to a bunch of Donald Trump rallies. Yeah, and things like that, exactly. Meantime, the White House has been trying to minimize the role that Paul Manafort played in the campaign, saying it was minor despite uh, working on it for several months. This week, Manafort denied fresh allegations against him over his ties to a Russian oligarch. Seen as Drew Griffin tonight reports. The latest connection between a close Trump associate and Russia was dug up by the Associated Press, reporting a 2005 memo in which Paul Manafort, already working for a Russian billionaire named Oleg Deripaska, was pitching a plan to greatly benefit the Putin government. Manafort confirmed to CNN he did work for Oleg Deripaska, but he rejects the Associated Press interpretation that he was pushing the political interests of Vladimir Putin, including to, quote, influence politics, business dealings, and news coverage inside the United States. I have always publicly acknowledged that I worked for Mr. Deripaska and his company, Rusal, to advance its interests, Manafort told CNN through a spokesman, adding, I did not work for the Russian government. Once again, Manafort writes, smear and innuendo are being used to paint a false picture. A spokesman for Deripaska told CNN, Manafort provided investment consulting services, but declined to provide any additional details. Manafort and his Russian billionaire had a major falling out. Court documents show Deripaska funneled nearly $19 million into a Manafort business venture registered in the Cayman Islands in 2007. They invested in a Ukrainian telecom company. But the deal went south, and according to a legal filing, Deripaska's company said Manafort simply disappeared. White House spokesman Sean Spicer this afternoon downplaying any connection this has to the president. He was a consultant. He had clients from around the world. There is no suggestion that he did anything improper or, and, but to suggest that the president um, knew who his clients were from a decade ago is a bit insane. He was hired to do a job. He did it. That's it. Plain and simple. It's just the latest Russian headline headache for the Trump administration. CNN has reported the FBI is already investigating possible connections between Trump campaign officials, including Manafort, and Russian officials. Manafort was fired by the Trump campaign on August 19th. That was the same day the FBI announced Manafort was involved in another investigation and another possible connection to Russia. This time it was his consulting work for the pro-Russian former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, who eventually had to flee his own country, seeking refuge in Russia with Vladimir Putin. The government of Ukraine opened an investigation into possible corruption and money laundering charges against Yanukovych and his political party after Manafort's name appeared on a ledger of $12.7 million in secret payments. Manafort denies he ever took money illegally from anyone in his worldwide consulting business. He denies he pushed any Russian agenda while working in Ukraine. And he now denies that connection with a Russian billionaire had anything to do with a plan to enrich Russian President Vladimir Putin. Drew Griffin, CNN, Atlanta. 
And we'll see if Mr. Manafort does end up talking to lawmakers. We'll be right back. Now, have a great weekend. This is CNN Breaking News. Breaking news indeed. The Trump administration reeling from a massive defeat at the hands of members of its own party. This is CNN Tonight. I'm Don Lemon. We often say that this is not politics as usual. Well, it's certainly not politics as usual for the president to be forced to pull his own health care bill at the last minute when he can't get the votes from his own party. A staggering failure for the man who prides himself on his ability to make deals. The man who during the campaign promised so much winning that you might get tired of it. Well, he gets a taste of defeat tonight. We were very close. Uh, it was a very, very tight margin. We had no Democrat support. We had no votes from the Democrats. Uh, they weren't going to give us a single vote, so it's a very difficult thing to do. I've been saying for the last year and a half that the best thing we can do, politically speaking, is let Obamacare explode. It is exploding right now. It's uh, many states have big problems. Almost all states have big problems. I was in Tennessee the other day, and they've lost half of their state in terms of an insurer. They have no insurer, and that's happening to many other places. I was in Kentucky the other day, and similar things are happening. So Obamacare is exploding. With no Democrat support, we couldn't quite get there. We're just a very small number of votes short in terms of getting our bill passed. And I think the losers are Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, because now they own Obamacare. They own it, 100 percent own it. And this is not a Republican health care. This is not anything but a Democrat health care. And they have Obamacare for a little while longer until it ceases to exist, which it will at some point in the near future. And just remember, this is not our bill. This is their bill. Everybody worked hard. I worked as a team player and would have loved to have seen it pass. But again, uh, I think you know I was very clear because I think there wasn't a speech I made or very few where I didn't mention that perhaps the best thing that could happen is exactly what happened today because we'll end up with a truly great health care bill in the future after this mess known as Obamacare explodes. So I like Speaker Ryan. He worked very, very hard. A lot of different groups. He's got a lot of factions. And there's been a long history of liking and disliking, even within the Republican Party, long before I got here. But I've had a great relationship with the Republican Party. It seems that both sides like Trump, and that's good. And you see that, I guess, more clearly than anybody. But we've had a, a I'm not going to speak badly about anybody within the party, but certainly there's a big history. There is a lot to discuss over the next couple of hours here on CNN. So I want to bring in CNN's Nia Malika Henderson and Mark Preston, also senior political commentator Jen Psaki, senior political analyst David Gergen, former Congressman Jack Kingston, who was a senior advisor to the Trump campaign, and CNN contributor Selena Zito. I should have listened to David Gergen because I said that they would get a pass. I was wrong. So, David, I'm just going to let you gloat on that for a moment, but I'm going to go to Mark Preston first. Mark, disastrous day for the Trump, the Republican lawmakers, for Paul Ryan, the worst week in this presidency, in his, this very short presidency, right. hugely embarrassing, as he would say. What, what happened? Who gets the blame here? Uh, I think the blame can be spread out a little bit. Uh, I think that Paul Ryan gets the blame for trying to push this bill to the House floor uh, when they clearly didn't have the votes. Uh, I believe that Donald Trump is to blame because as the president, he should be uh, willing to invest uh, all that he has got into something that he ran on. Uh, I, I put blame on the Republican Party as a whole to, to uh, basically try to legislate by a campaign promise, which was repeal and replace instead of saying we're going to go in and fix and make better, uh, although it doesn't sound as good. Uh, and, and I do think that it, that it is ridiculous for the president uh, to, to go out there and say, this is the Democrats' fault because, right, yeah. I mean, right. unless I'm living in an alternative universe, and I very well might be, the Democrats had nothing to do with it. In fact, they're usually not that good strategically, and yeah. they were very smart not to get involved in this 
at all. Who on the panel remembers, uh, did any Republicans vote for the Affordable Care Act in the House or the Senate? No. 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 So, no. I mean... <laughs> I know I did not. I may have been the only one eligible. <laughs> I'm like, so I, was, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand why he said it. And I mean, maybe it was just in frustration. Like, those guys didn't help us at all. But listen, Nia, President Trump is supposed to be the closer. Right. This is what he promised on the campaign trail. Watch this. I'm going to make the great deals. I am going to make great deals for our country. I've built an extraordinary business on relationships and deals that benefit all parties involved, always. We need somebody with great energy, with great passion, with great deal-making skills. And we need a closer. We need closers. I've watched the politicians. I've dealt with them all my life. If you can't make a good deal with a politician, then there's something wrong with you. You're certainly not very good. And that's what we have representing us. That last one is particularly singing. If you can't make yeah. a deal with politicians, there's something wrong really with good. him. Perhaps so, he's not very good. <laughs> Listen, I, don't, I think that uh, Democrats should not be gloating, right? They right. should just, they should be, um, if they think they're winners, right? They should be, because we've said so much about the Republicans in the Trump administration being sore winners. Right, right? right. They should be gracious winners in all of this because it could, it could very easily have been them. But he has said this over and over. Only I can fix it. Yeah. I am the art of the deal maker. That's right. I alone can fix it was his statement uh, when he accepted the nomination of his party uh, last summer. And all of this talk about being smarter than the folks uh, who were in those positions, smarter than the establishment, uh, and this idea that he was part of this movement, leading a movement, uh, and could get it done and use kind of the, the will of the people uh, and, and, and kind of the power of the people to get things done uh, and shake up Washington and, and do this. And remember, he said he would do it immediately. I mean, at, at some point he talked about a repealing it and replacing it at the same time. He yeah. also talked about doing it on, on day one, and, and he hasn't done it. And now he's in this position where he's he's just kind of saying, uh, I, you know, my name is Bennett, and I'm not in it. You're using the problem, yeah, but it's yeah, my name. I, know, I, I, I am not but, in it. I, right. But I'm hearing some revisionist history saying, oh, he didn't say, even he said, I didn't say I would repeal and replace it right away, not in the first thing. He's on day one. Yes, there are yes. Over and over again. He's of sound yes, bites, if yes. not hundreds he of said it like 60 one. times. I mean, yeah. this was, uh, and, and there is this sense of like, oh, well, he didn't really, he, he only adopted the language of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. uh, he adopted it, he ran with it, and this is what voters yeah. expected from him. And this idea that he can just now say it's the Democrats' fault. Yeah. I mean, I think you'll hear some people, like probably Kingston uh, there, uh, and, and, <laughs> and Jeffrey Lord, uh, <laughs> touting those talking points. I just don't think it's yeah. going to work. I mean, is he going to stand well, by as premiums rise and people lose their health insurance and just say, oh, it's Nancy Pelosi's fault? Say, say what you want, well, Jack Kingston. Presidenting <laughs> uh, okay, is hard. A, a couple of things. I, you know, knowing Donald Trump, this is part of the negotiation. I, I, every oh, single God. Republican. Oh, no, I want to hear this, everybody. Okay. I, I really want to hear this. Every single Republican in the room, in the Congress, ran on repeal and replace. Every single one of you them said this over last and night. over and over again. Yeah. So now they're going back home and they got to face a primary opponent who's going to be reminding them of that or they've got to get the job done. So the um, scenario where they go to the White House and say, uh, Mr. President, we've been thinking it over, we've been hearing from our Republican base back home, and we have very Republican red districts, mm -hmm. we actually do need to move something and we're ready to talk. I think that puts him in the upper hand, and I would not put it past a guy like Donald Trump who knows how to negotiate. <laughs> Uh, I, you made some of these okay. points last night, but listen, David Gergen, I mean, the fact is, is that these, the holdouts in the Republican Party, they were hearing what Jack is saying. They were hearing that from their constituents. They did not like this bill, and they went with what their constituents wanted, not necessarily what the president wanted. That's true. Uh, and the, I think one of the lessons Donald Trump might draw from this is the job of the president is to be more than the negotiator in an inside game with members of Congress calling him down to the White House. The first job of the president is to come up with policies which he's passionate about and not to outsource uh, the ideas that he and, and the structure of the bill that he was doing on health care. He, he outsourced it to Paul Ryan and then he sort of came along for the ride. He didn't do his homework. He wasn't familiar with a lot of the aspects of it. He wasn't a good, good negotiator as a result. But very importantly, Don, the other aspect of the presidency which I think he needs to 
which I think would be good for his team to be thinking about and he could learn about, uh, is that there, if there's an inside game that you play in Washington and there's an outside game which is extraordinarily important in order to bring pressure on Washington to do your bidding. And that outside game has been mastered by people like Reagan, it, our FDR, you can go through the presidents have done it so well, and that is you build up a coalition of forces on the outside, doctors, nurses, hospitals, which they all of which went against him on this, he needed them on his side. He needed to get the public, he needed to sell the bill to right. the public. Instead, he sold the politics of negotiation to the public mm -hmm. instead of telling him what was in it. So you go there with a 17 percent approval rating for the bill and people are listening to their constituents. You know, Donald, one last point if I make it briefly. Yeah. Very important for the president. Other presidents have stumbled in the first hundred days. Mm -hmm. The real issue is do you learn from that? Very importantly, Jack Kennedy with the Bay of Pigs. It was a disaster and he didn't go around pointing fingers at everybody else. He took it upon himself to relearn what he needed to know to be president. He called in Eisenhower, he talked to a lot of other people, why did I get this so wrong, how do I fix this, how do I get better? And 14 months later when the Cuban Missile Crisis came along, he was a superb leader. He learned how to lead as president, and that's something this president, you know, he's talented, he didn't say but, he doesn't, president. but yeah. he doesn't know how to be president. But He doesn't know how to be president. But, 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 but hold, hold on, Jack, hold on, Jack. What do you uh, what do you make, David, of Jack's assessment? Of, oh, this is a negotiating tactic on the part of Donald Trump. I, I, it's a good spin, but I, 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 I don't. Yeah, I, I, if you're asking me, I don't. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't <laughs> it. Well, here, here's what I'm here's what I'm saying. If, if I'm a guy who promised to repeal Obamacare and repeal it hasn't and been done and my party has been in the majority, then I'm going to be held accountable, particularly in my own primary, but generally as well. So I do yeah. think that they're going to start thinking, yeah. well, we, okay. we need to come up with plan B. I got to get, I got to get the others in here. So, uh, Selena, uh, let's, I want you to check out these headlines. This is from the Washington Post. The closer, question mark? The inside story of how Trump tried and failed to make a deal on health care from Reuters. For Trump, it was the lost art of the deal from uh, the LA Times, it turns out Donald Trump is not an artist of the deal. So he sees himself as a deal maker. How is he going to react to all of this? Are we going to see another Saturday morning tweet storm? Somebody needs to take the phone away from him right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I, even he can admit, well, maybe, he can admit <laughs> that this, maybe, uh -oh. uh, that this was not a really great day. Uh, the best thing that he could do at this point is to move forward on another subject and, and try to put this behind him. Uh, you know, I, I saw a lot of things coming out of the White House today about Keystone Pipeline and, you know, you know so you diversion. saw that. Right, diversion. It would be really smart. This is what good salespeople do, right? And, and so I think that's probably his best bet. It's, you know, I have interviewed a lot of people today about this out in Ohio and in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, n no one thought it was a great day. I, I think the part, the, I think both the president and Congress um, are going to struggle with the messaging behind this, uh, especially Congress. I mean, it sort of reinforces that thing that the Congress just doesn't work, right? But yeah. the president was brought in on this, uh, and this was a problem for him today, yeah. for sure. Uh, Jen, so Jen Saki, I want to get in because Jen, you've lived this, and you—I'm sure you're sitting there all day going, "I told you so, I told you so, I told you so." <laughs> so the question is: Is is there an opportunity or an opening here for the president to broaden his coalition or his support? bring in the Democrats, work with the Democrats on maybe fixing the Affordable Care Act or in some way um, to get them along with other uh, legislative issues that he wants to get accomplished. Well, the credit here doesn't really actually belong to Democrats in Washington. It belongs to a lot of Democrats and people across the country who showed up at town halls and went to protest. So let's start there. But the fact is that everyone from President Obama to Hillary Clinton to Bernie Sanders has been talking about the fact that there need to be changes to Obamacare. There needs to be more competition in the marketplace. That's the reality. Uh, it certainly is not in a death spiral. The CBO said it wasn't. That's a ridiculous Republican talking point. But there are changes that need to be made. You're so right. The, the question fact is, checks don't bear out on, on that Obamacare right. is imploding. That just, just exactly. Not true. But, so but the, the only the, way the only way that it will collapse is is if Republicans who now have the majority 
uh, want it to collapse, but it, it is not imploding. You That's can read right. Any fact check well, and I'll tell you. But, then, but, then, but, then the fact is, let me point. finish. The fact is that there are options out there now. A lot of Democrats support a public option. If Republicans have a better option for bringing more competition to the marketplace, they should put that forward. So now is a real test, and certainly Democrats have indicated a willingness to come to the table, and I expect they would and they should. Yeah. All right. Stick around, everyone. Hold that thought, Mark. I know you want to get in. When we come right back, uh, will this go down as the worst 100 days? for any president in history, plus some new revelations about Michael Flynn's work for a foreign government, a first -hand. President Trump made a lot of big promises for his first 100 days, but here we are, day 64, with what looks like one failure after another. Back with me now, my panel, and Mark, let me explain that, because here's a big picture now. President Trump uh, just failed on health care, the travel ban blocked by the courts twice. He was going to rip up the Iran nuclear deal on day one. Didn't happen. The wall was going to be paid for by Mexico. That didn't happen. They say no way. President Trump says he was wiretapped by uh, the former president, Barack Obama. Not true. All while under a cloud of, of this Russia investigation. Um, there's going to be so much winning. Seriously, so, where he said we're going to we're so much winning that we would get tired of winning. I'm really tired right now, but it's not, it's not so much about the winning. You, you, you know, like, all kidding aside, though, uh, in 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 the I'm serious. Earlier, I'm serious. Yeah. What? I'm not kidding. Winning? I was serious. About he what? Said, about winning. He said it was going to be so much. Oh, winning. I mean, listen. There's a whole lot. There's a long yeah. way to go. Nowhere to go years. but up. It's yeah. Right. There's a lot of track uh, ahead of him to do some laps on. But this is why it is such a big deal. This Russia investigation is coming back fast. This was it was sidetracked. For a day, it is coming back full force. That is going to take him off message. You have members of Congress now who are, who might have been scared of Donald Trump. They're no longer scared of Donald Trump. They know that they can defeat uh, Donald Trump on issues. You also have basically an inability for the Republican leadership and for Donald Trump to get together on the same page and get something done that they have promised for so many uh, years moving forward and have made these campaign promises. And quite frankly, the issues that they want to tackle moving forward, tax reform, yeah. that's not easy. How long does a honeymoon usually last? For it's over now. It's over. Yeah, I don't even know if you ever had It might be 100 days, but it's yeah. over. It might have been, quite frankly, it might have been the Saturday after the inauguration <laughs> yeah. when they, when they yeah. sent yeah. Sean Spicer out yeah. to, 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 Jack, to uh, repeat, Jack wants uh, to jump in, but you have a suggestion for Jack, don't you? Yeah, well, well Jack, as, as we were talking here, and Selena Zito so smartly said, as she often does, that somebody should take away the, uh, President Trump's phone. I am nominating you, Jack, <laughs> to give about six hours Great right now Jack. to get that phone okay. out of his hands. <laughs> I, I'm going to make sure that the Washington Post doesn't run the honeymoon program next time <laughs> also. Um, but, but let me say this. Um, you know, he did get the Keystone Pipeline today. That was seven years of... of uh, Obama delay. He just announced that Charter Communication is going to have a $25 billion Jack, that's, investment. Jack, that Charter Communication, thing, that charter communication it, it, thing has been in the works for four years. They announced it, it, this last year. They, they did the thing last year, and they made the announcement today. It had nothing to do with President Trump. That is well, simply Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know about that. He, All right, well, you should check it out. His we, watch and CNN did it. If you go to CNNMoney.com, or the, or it's, got the, it's got the complete fact check on you there. You know, uh, that it was like Fact checking Trump's latest White House jobs announcement. Charter said that it would invest $25 billion. Uh, this, okay. was announced, that this was announced. It's been in the works for at least one year. Uh, but and they've been it, okay. working on it, listen, right? Don, anything for almost that happens, four years. Okay, I'm going to keep going on. Carrier, <laughs> I'm Carrier Lockheed, the growth in the stock market. The same market, thing about Carrier. Investment. You can but look at all of those. The, if you, here's the thing that people should be informed. What about Jack, the Supreme Court? Jack, I we want will people. Get hold court. on. The Supreme Court is not a done deal yet. But it will I want happen. people. I want our viewers to be informed. All of these jobs and carriers and all of this that that they've been announcing. I, people should go back and look at the original start dates of this. M many of those had nothing to do with this president except that when they made the announcement he happened to be president, but go on. Okay, when you are president and you are the regulatory king of the land called yeah. Barack Obama versus a guy who says I'm going to deregulate some of these job killing problems and the red tape out of Washington on businesses, what happened? Businesses get optimistic again and they start investing, they start expanding and they start hiring people and that's exactly what's going on in the marketplace which is why the stock market has gone up so much and, and I speak to a lot of businessmen. I used to have an honest job and I was in business and I yeah. can promise you 
my friends are very optimistic under Donald Trump because they're not going to have things like uh, the Department of yeah. Labor changing the definition of fidelity and and a hurt I think you have a, I think you got a fair point with that because the stock market which is a which is about really about how people's perspective and their attitude on that and also Gorsuch did do uh, people think he did a good job on his hearings and he's probably going to go through but my point was that it's just not a done deal yet uh, David do you say that this was the worst 100 days of any presidency so far uh, we'll have to wait, we'll have to wait so and far, see. full yeah, stop, so, and that's it, right? Uh, Sam Feist here at CNN sent me a note, said that you forgot William Henry Harrison. Uh, you know, he he was the guy who caught pneumonia because he, re he refused to have a coat and walk, <laughs> rode down Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue on his horse, caught pneumonia, and died. Well, that was a pretty bad start. Uh, but, uh, Rough company. But, uh, but if you look you at presidents it. who you know gone through the first hundred days, yeah, but Don, a lot of them have stumbled. Yeah. There's no question. Bill Clinton about that. had a had a tumultuous uh, first. Uh, he did. But, you know, he got into no, don't ask, don't tell. I remember, he slipped into that. He went when he wasn't ready for that. It caused an uproar. He had some other problems like that. So, uh, all presidents make mistakes. One of the paradoxes of the presidency is you have to make some of your most important decisions when you're least ready, when you're least educated, and least uh, you know settled into the job. Having said that, uh, you know, as, as he has done in so many other ways, Donald Trump breaks all boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, and his, he's had a terrible week, terrible mm -hmm. week. His, his credibility was badly damaged in the beginning of the week on this wiretapping business. The, the clouds have come back over the Russian connections, as, uh, as, as Mark just said, and now, he's, now his capacity as president, his good deal-making capacity, are called into question. I think those are very tough blows for him, and I want to make this one last point. What has been happening here now is beginning to make it harder to get his next things done. Jack talked about the rally in the markets. Notably, the markets have been going south for the last four days. Yep. You know, they, this has not been a good week because a lot of investors are now worried he's not going to get the big tax cuts that he's promised. He may not get a big infrastructure It depended bill. on this part of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, just, it becomes a lot harder to get tax reform done after failing on health care. Health care was a linchpin into getting some savings on the deficits, which he could then it would make it easier to pay for uh, the tax cuts. And now he but, doesn't have that. And that's why Paul Ryan, who manned up today, by the way, mm -hmm. unlike the president, said, I take responsibility here. I've got some things to learn. Uh, while he was pointing out, though, tax cuts, tax reform is going to be a lot harder now. Jen, I, I, but, but, Jen, I want to ask you, because um, you, I think that the former president, and cer certainly President Bill Clinton, realized that they had to change their ways in order to, or their tactics at least, in order to get things uh, done in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump is somewhat of a chameleon, but it's been very hard for him to change and become presidential in the normal way that we are used to seeing people. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, I'm going to become pr so presidential, I'm going to be boring. That hasn't happened yet. He's going to have to change, right, in order to get things done? Uh, absolutely. Um, look, David's absolutely right that every president stumbles at some point in time, early, later in the later in the program, either way. But there are some bad habits we saw from Donald Trump over the last couple of weeks. Um, that included a lack of intellectual curiosity about the bill he was supposed to be selling. He was selling the politics, not the substance. Obviously, that didn't work. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't able to pull a coalition together. He didn't use the outside game in terms of using the political capital that helped him get elected. So there are a number of things he's going to have to change. Mark also touched on the fact that tax reform is extremely difficult. There's a reason it hasn't happened in 30 years, uh, because it's very hard and involves very tough choices. And again, Donald Trump made a number of promises on the tra trail about lowering the corporate tax rate to 15 percent, not raising middle class taxes. That are very hard to do, and they're not going to be paid for by the border adjustment ta tax. Yeah. That is dead in the Senate. Yeah. So yeah. this is also very but, difficult, and, and that's and next. You, but remember, you wonder also thing, if the people around him are going to have to change. Uh, in, in the beginning of some uh, administrations, you also start to see some shuffling in, in White House yeah. staffs. Uh, the, you know, we talk about the failure and the blame to go around. I think you can place some blame on Bannon, you can place some blame on Priebus, you can place some blame, blame on Kellyanne Conway in terms of how they went about this, in terms of yeah. how they dealt with people on the Hill, uh, threatening them sometimes in terms of they would put a primary uh, candidate against some of these uh, folks if they it's voted not against. It didn't work. It's, it's not working. Right. Selena, uh, hang on. Uh, Jack, Jack, I need to get Selena in here. Selena, so he needs wins. And the thing is, if he's going to have to change, I wonder how that's going to, his folks, his base is going to like that. But he's going to have to change to get some wins. Yes, no? Yes, somewhat. I mean, American politics is all about geography, right? So if you look at the, the latest NBC Wall Street Journal 
poll, yeah. it shows that, that Trump is at about 37 percent. But if you break it down and you look at people that live in exurban and rural areas, he's at about 55 to 60 percent. Mm -hmm. So his voters are still willing to give him a longer leash uh, than, than all voters are. We'll see. So, yeah, we'll, I mean, I, I, he's... He's still not losing them yet, yeah. but this certainly was not a great day. It's going to be interesting to see the polling after this. Yeah. Thank you all. I yeah, appreciate sure. it. When we come right back, former director of the CIA reveals the shocking and possibly illegal suggestion that Michael Flynn made to members of a foreign government. Stunning new revelations tonight about President Trump's former national security advisor, General Michael Flynn. He, of course, lost his job for lying about his communications with the Russian ambassador. And, and earlier this month, Flynn filed paperwork identifying himself as a foreign agent who did work for the government of Turkey. Now, revelations about illegal activities discussed during a meeting between Flynn and Turkish officials. Joining me now exclusively, Ambassador James Woolsey, the former director of Central Intelligence who was at that meeting, and James V. Grimaldi, senior writer for the Wall Street Journal who broke the story. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I'm going to rely on my notes a lot because I want to make sure I get it right because I think the wording is important here. So you attended this meeting with General Michael Flynn, the Turkish government officials. This was late last summer during the campaign. Yes. What happened there was disturbing enough for you to inform U.S. officials at the time. So please tell me what happened at this meeting. Well, it was disturbing, but it was also confusing. Uh, first of all, I was on a television show, and so I came late to this function. <coughs> I was, uh, it, it had been taking place for, for, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour. And so a number of issues and points were, had already been uh, talked about. And so what I saw and heard was uh, the sort of the end of a conversation. It's, it's not entirely clear what, what transpired because of that. But it uh, looks uh, uh, as if uh, there uh, was at least uh, some strong suggestion by the um, one or more of the Americans present at the meeting uh, to the Turks that uh, we would be able, the United States would be able through them to uh, get hold of uh, Gulan uh, the uh, rival uh, for uh, Turkey's uh, 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 political situation. Gulan, uh, right, right. right. Okay. And uh, uh, strongly uh, feared by the current president. Who, so who was at this meeting? Uh, I don't have all the, the names memorized, but there were two uh, senior uh, uh, Turks. Uh, uh, Donald, one. let me add to that that... Uh, there were some government filings by Mr. Flynn and his uh, lawyers that disclosed who were at this meeting on the same date, and they included the son-in-law of uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, as well as the foreign minister, the equivalent of their secretary of state. Mm -hmm. So bet between what we have from these public documents and what uh, Jim Wolsey has told me, we've been able to piece together what happened. And I want to point out that I've independently confirmed, uh, along with Meg Coker and Diane Nissenbaum, uh, the account that we heard from Jim Woolsey. Mm -hmm. When these documents, these uh, foreign lobbying documents, were filed with the government by Mr. Flynn, um, it, it made reference to this meeting and the staggering amount of money that he and his firm, Flynn Intel Group, had received, half a million dollars for what supposedly was a film and a little report that they were going to do for an Israeli gas company. Mm -hmm. It didn't add up, and so I pressed Jim Woolsey to say, what, what really was going on? What did you do? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's where we narrowed in on this meeting. So let's talk about Fethullah Gulen. He's a cleric who Turkey w uh, has accused of orchestrating last summer's failed military coup in, in Turkey. Um, so what were, they, what were they planning to do with him, oh, he, James? He lives in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, he has a green card. He's a permanent resident alien in the United States. Uh, and um, he and uh, Erdogan uh, were once very, very close. And now he's Erdogan's greatest enemy. Erdogan uh, has contended that he was responsible for the coup attempt uh, last summer uh, and many other awful things beside. And he provides the rationale, that is, his, his being there, provides uh, the rationale for a lot of the uh, uh, incarcerations that uh, have been followed by. So, they were, so in, in terms of discussions here, they were trying to remove him from the country. 
Was that is that they, kidnapping? They, they want him uh, want him out of the United States and in Turkey. Right. And the reason I'm being cautious about how this is worded is because I wasn't there for much of this this meeting, but. The I, I would say it was a little bit like uh, uh, if you see something, say something uh, on the on the train. Uh, it was suspicious. It was concerning, and I felt I needed to say something about it to someone. But was it a clear plot that they were going to seize him? Uh, no, uh, it was. So that's between. what. He, so James Garaldi, from what yes. you heard, was this kidnapping? Would, did they want to kidnap him out of the U.S. to take him well, back to Turkey? I think the, the, what we understood the discussion to be is almost sort of a blue sky. You know, how can we get this man out of the country? You have to understand that the Turkish government and Erdogan were seemingly obsessed with Gulan and uh, were, had tried desperately with the Obama administration to no avail to get him extradited. They had not presented evidence that was sufficient to meet a uh, standard in the United States or in a legal court that would get him extradited back to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they were trying to, to come up with ways in which they could figure out how can we get him out of the country and back to Turkey. Mm -hmm. So when you, Ambassador, when you realized what was going on potentially, that it was potentially illegal, what did you do? Well, uh, uh, the next day, uh, I uh, told several people, uh, including one uh, mutual friend of uh, uh, the Vice President and myself, uh, in order to uh, uh, basically report to the government. This and was Vice President was, Biden at the time. Uh, this, right. It was a friend, not, not, not the Vice President but, himself. But he was the Vice President at the time, yeah. And I, uh, um, I think that it's, uh, it's fair to say that uh, uh, it was a deeply concerning uh, conversation, but it was not one that I could, in a court of law, for example, say there was a clear plot to kidnap Gulan. Okay, so this, this meeting happened on September 19th of 2016, yes. right? Yes. Right? Um, you resigned as senior advisor to, I, I remember I had you on the show, I think it was the yeah. same day or a few days after, on January 5th of 2017. Why did you stay with the Trump team, given that what happened was so troubling to you. First of all, these things have nothing to do with one another, as far as I know. Uh, uh, the only thing that I was doing with the, the Trump group was uh, that I had uh, chosen to uh, uh, offer advice uh, to uh, the Trump campaign rather than uh, Hillary's uh, campaign and uh, was available, but I wasn't being uh, used particularly because General Flynn was the, the uh, uh, sort of traffic cop of who, who helped on what. And so uh, I uh, was not doing anything particularly for the campaign, and then when the transition came, uh, I started doing a great deal of press, uh, but I was expressing my own view. I, I wasn't representing uh, the, the Trump campaign, and so did you ever? Did you ever um, give your concerns to the Trump people? Yeah, you know, what, what I did was they kept carrying me on chirons and television as a senior advisor to the Trump. Uh, uh, transition group and I really wasn't I didn't want to fly under a false flag uh, so I just had him remove that designation but it wasn't that I was switching sides I had supported uh, before I supported anyone I, I supported uh, Trump beginning in uh, August early September and uh, then uh, for the rest of the time the rest of the campaign I supported him all right I want you to stand by because hang, hang on James Mr. Will, okay. hang on I gotta have to get to the break and I'll let you get in here but I also want to say that General Flynn is responding to this. We'll hear what he has to say and we'll hear from my guests right after this break. Telling revelations about former Trump National Security Advisor General Michael Flynn and his work as a foreign agent. Back with me now exclusively, uh, Ambassador James Woolsey and James Grimaldi, who is a writer who broke the story for us from the Wall Street Journal. You wanted to talk about the relationship between uh, Grimaldi and Flynn, right, that they had with the ambassador? Uh, yeah, between Mr. Woolsey and Mr. Woolsey and Mr. Yeah, and Mr. Mr. Flynn, right. Uh, well, Mr. Flynn was really acting as a bit of an intermediary, maybe even blocking or preventing, I, from what I understand, Mr. Woolsey from having very many conversations with the Trump campaign. And in that sense, when he talks about his inability to sort of, you know, converse on this, that's why he stepped back from it, as he explained it to me. Uh, and it seems like Mr. Flynn also uh, was was uh, uh, employing him or bringing him along to this meeting 
and as Mr. Wolsey explained it to me, he was not told that this was going to be the discussion of the meeting, mm -hmm. yet Mr. Flynn's business partner, Bijan King, insisted that he be there, insisted that he be picked up by a car and brought over to the meeting. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to have a discussion like this, what better than to have a former CIA director? Mm -hmm. well, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that although uh, Mike Flynn had asked me a year or so previously if I'd serve on an advisory group for his uh, Flynn enterprise, his Flynn operation, and I agreed to do that, uh, I took no money for it. Uh, I went to no meetings. Uh, I had no telephone conference calls uh, with the Flynn group. Uh, I basically had nothing to do with them. They were just a, a, a do name on the resume. Either one of you, the, do you think I, he, he's trading on his relationship with the, with the Trump administration or the incoming administration for favors? Or what, what's going on here? It, it's hard to say. James might have a better idea. Uh, it, 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 well, he, you know, it's, it's really sort of amazing that he, was op he, was ex he took half a million dollars uh, from this client for reasons that are still kind of murky and unclear that included this meeting. At the same time, he's advising the Trump campaign, the major nominee of the Republican Party. Um, y you know, it seems like the two don't necessarily go together, and he was really on, I think, very shaky territory. Now, I, I, I hasten to add that Mr. Flynn and his spokesman have denied uh, that this occurred at the meeting, but let, let me read. Let me read their statement, okay? Because uh, a spokesman, as you said, for General Flynn, uh, disputed your account of the meeting, Ambassador, uh, in a statement tonight, saying, "Quote: The claim made by Mr. Woolsey that General Flynn or anyone else in, in attendance discussed physical removal of Mr. Gulan from the United States during a meeting with Turkish officials in New York is false. No such discussion occurred, nor did Mr. Woolsey." ever informed General Flynn that he had any concerns whatsoever regarding the meeting, either before he chose to attend or afterwards. What's your reaction to that? Well, it's true. I never informed Flynn, and I would definitely not take that path. I informed other people that I thought were, were quite uh, responsible. Uh, I uh, uh, was, uh, I, I don't know what was going through Flynn's mind in taking the course that he took. Uh, and as I've said several times, including this evening, uh, I am not claiming that there was a concrete plan that was being fleshed out uh, at the meeting. Uh, but there was a good deal of discussion of that general direction uh, that uh, James has so uh, well described mm -hmm. of uh, trying to uh, uh, put uh, 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 Gulan essentially out of action. I have to ask you. I, I want to just James. add. Two, I want to add two things. One. Uh, Mr. Woolsey told several people contemporaneous, and I've spoken with them, and they've confirmed that. Separately, we've independently confirmed it uh, through uh, another avenue. Uh, and so, therefore, this is not just sort of a one-sided, uh, you know, uh, description that we have. Mm -hmm. I also uh, want to talk about him, um, you know, registering as a foreign agent, also the compensation that he was getting from Turkey, and what sort of more tonight about former Trump advisor General Michael Flynn and his work as a foreign agent. Back now exclusively with me, Ambassador James Woolsey and James Grimaldi, uh, the writer for the Wall Street Journal who broke the story. So. We learned that this month that uh, Flynn filed paperwork with the Justice Department retroactively disclosing work that he did during the campaign as an agent. Your report, this report gives insight into what he was doing. So what, is this, what was going on? He, he, didn't, he registered after he was fired for yes. lying to the vice president. And Mike Flynn apparently is a gift that keeps on giving because uh, one of the other things he did in that registration was to register me as a foreign agent, uh, and I'm not. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it really is uh, quite striking. How can, how, how can he do I that? I put my title and, and retired status and so forth in the filing, along with, along with three or four other was people. Was there anything he may have, else in this meeting that you heard or you saw that, give, that gives you pause or that gave you pause? In this meeting, you mean the one back in Yeah, in or, or, it, or with your interactions, you were in this room, or with your interactions with Michael Flynn? I just agreed to be on his advisory board. I had essentially nothing to do with uh, Flynn for month after month after month. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, I think, used that meeting with, uh, 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 with the Turks in order to try to create the impression that I was, and he told people that I reported to him, that he was my boss. None of that's true, even remotely true. Do you think that this hurt any of this coming out in your relationship with him? And uh, because I think seemingly he didn't think that you were interested in, in helping him at all. 
Um, do you think it hurt your chances with the administration or any? I don't know. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. So what do you think of this, of him, uh, James, being registered, uh, registering retroactively as a foreign agent after he was fired? Well, it seems to me that it's something the lawyers really pressured him to do when they looked at exactly what he was doing. Uh, they uh, had a more anodyne description of what actually happened at this meeting, but I can tell you that uh, the person that Jim Mulsey told to tell Vice President Biden uh, told me that uh, Vice President Biden was very upset about this, pretty angry. And I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't tell law enforcement, and that might have even triggered some of these uh, incidental wiretaps that we keep hearing about uh, from Chairman Nunes the other day or what have you. And all of this could get end up swept into an overall FBI investigation for all we know. So you think and it was what, Turkey and maybe not Russia? Is that what you're saying? It, it could have been that was one of the things that was overheard in the, the incidental conversations. You know, what's interesting well, and about... Nunes the, said that the new information had nothing to do with Russia, so when he came out uh, yesterday or the day before. Right. So it very well could have been Turkey. And in fact, when we asked the Turkish officials about this yeah. very carefully in multiple places, they, they acknowledged they'd had a meetings with uh, Flynn and they yeah. uh, didn't uh, say anything about our specific, very specific questions about what was discussed at this meeting. They did not deny that that was discussed in the meeting. They simply said uh, that was not our meeting that we went to. I don't know if this is a yes or no answer because I'm, I'm running up against a time issue here, but do you think that there's w what exposure if any, does Flynn have to, with this? There's been talk of the Logan Act that he was representing uh, allegedly the U.S. government when he didn't have a right to do that, but no one's ever been charged under the Logan Act. I believe Mr. Wolsey knows, what, yeah. the Adams administration? I think, yes, I think you're right. In the Adams administration, I think there was one prosecution. Just real quickly, Ambassador, why now? Why come forward now? Why... Yeah, why come forward now instead because of... Because I forward? asked him. <laughs> <laughs> I read the, I read yeah, the I want to hear from records him. I want that, to hear that from they him. filed, uh, these lobbying records, and his, his title is in there, and I, I wanted I, to know what he'd done. But I want to hear done. from him. He, could not, he didn't have to come That's forward, but why? Well, <laughs> I, once he started using my name yeah. uh, without my permission, uh, I felt like some kind of an answer uh, was just called for. I just didn't want to sit there silently uh, while he was doing that. And I was report. digging. I was going to find out what happened. <laughs> so uh, I, and I persuaded him to go.